Our next and final presenter for the day is Bogdan Budnik, who is going to tell us about his efforts to classify cells into cell populations using uh, the protein abundances measured in single cells. Ah, okay, good, good. Okay, good. Yeah, uh, well, that's what I think how it happens. It's, you know, I usually don't like computers and then don't like me either. And uh, that's a mutual and it's for a long time. And I guess it will be for the rest of my life. That's why I need someone who really like computers because what we try to do here really requires them, unfortunately. And um, what I would like to, uh, well, first of all, thank you everyone for coming. You know, I would like to welcome you survivors of those of you who actually done through the whole day as a you know co-organizer of this comp uh, of this you know event i really enjoy to see that it's growing and i hopefully it will grow uh, we probably don't have a plans to overgrow ISMS, but we should be close to it. Um, here I would like to present as a last talk, and I know you all tired, I would like to do uh, very quickly our vision of where the single cell is, uh, how we can actually uh, go into the biology of things and what we would like to do. There is a new, uh, new name we put here, and, and usually we like to put names of something which is uh, and new things and new ideas, and I will just go about naming in my talk too. Basically, uh, okay, finally, good. Okay, uh, well, this is the slide that I'm, I'm, I'm starting a uh, conference as the last time. That's exactly the same slide. You know, single cell proteomics was uh, originated in around 2015. At that time, uh, Nikolai was uh, still across the river at Harvard. We've been working together in, in my lab on very different projects, and he always was just trying as a true biologist to you know, uh, force me to idea how we can get into the single cell. As a normal mass spectrometrist, I told him that it's not possible. But in the end, we kind of got to the conclusion that we should try, and you know, as a collaborative effort on this, you know, we came up with the technique that you all know. I don't want to repeat too much. You know, the limitation part has already been uh, uh, explained earlier. There was the Kavaris piece. That was uh, extremely hard to do. And, you know, poor Ezra was doing it for the whole year. And he was just doing a great job. But unfortunately, we have to give, uh, give up on that and just move something else. Uh, I would like to kind of look through the scope MS technique, how it actually went through the year for, since the last year and just go through our stages where we were. As you, can, uh, as you all know from the original publication here about the January uh, 2016, uh, we had a 16 cells, which was differentially put here uh, between J and U, our favorite guinea pigs as the two cell lines we're looking for. We just been able to separate them in about dozens of proteins. At that time, we've been able to uh, been realistically uh, be in 800 proteins level, although in, in the article it says in the thousand, that was our actually highest possible uh, um, way of looking at things, and those are based about 1,500 peptides. That's where we started from. That's where all it's actually we start thinking that it's possible. We believe in ourselves and start moving from there. Uh, the first things I will not spend too much, the MPOP, that's the Harrison already presented yesterday. Basically, there was a uh, first step to get, get uh, uh, over the covariance uh, limitation because it was expensive. It was a lot of labor and it's costly. That's why we have to go to something which is cheap, uh, automated, and then fully automated, and it's just low cost the preparation. All the details are here. It's a great technique. I really recommend it to go through, but it was a, a major step to overcome the sample preparation problems. Uh, since the first publication, we moved to different system. We start from the uh, elite. Uh, now we're working everything in HFX orbit trap here, as you can see in my lab, you know, the kind of synergy of 21st uh, century technology with this something like early 20th century technology. And the double pump here, which is, helps a lot and uh, gives us a boost in the amount of samples we can produce here. This beautiful machine here, I really love in my lab. Uh, that's a robot mantis who is doing a lot of work for us. All the single cell being prepared for the 96 wall plate. That's our best uh, 
approach. We like 96 volt plates. It's just everything goes smoothly there. The all uh, preparation done through the fax sorting. We do everything through the fax sorting. Again, we really like this idea to fax sort things because we, we would like to know that single cells are intact. We'll know that they are single cell pro well of the 96 volt plate. Total volume would just drop to one microliter of everything. It contains all, all the buffers there, all the uh, trypsin buffer, everything there. And as I said, everything done by Mantis robot. Currently, we, uh, we set up all our measurements or we settled because we've tried different things. We settled on the 90 minutes gradients and these 90 minutes gradients more or less representative how it looks like. That's our trypsin friends here. You know, we like trypsin for what it does, but of course we hate autolysis, but that's part of the game. And the biggest peaks, of course, always in our uh, chromatography, the autolysis peak of trypsin. But we want to be sure that each cell being actually digested fully, there is no uh, undigested or semi-triptic peptides in our analysis because it's very important. They have to be absolutely identical to what the carrier channel look like. So this is the current setup, and that's uh, uh, how the scope of mass went uh, further down. Uh, data from about November, uh, the same guinea pigs, the Jurkat and U193.7 cells been done now with MPOP technique, with the scope MS technique. Here is the separation. What I would like to pay attention you to that it's a three plates here represented for 396 volt plates. At that point, we have 239 cells that's been actually quantifiable, meaning we didn't lose it or we have a, a good digestions. At that point, we had about 1,400 proteins based on almost 6,000 peptides. Everything is 1% FDR. That's a standard kind of uh, search criteria that we put on all of our data that we're working with. Uh, heat map represents these two, you know, that J and U just separates on the heat map. Not very well visible in this screen. And as you can see, we, we like the stream analysis of our data. Our statistical analysis of this particular data shows that there is a 55 differentially expressed proteins that actually separates GNU cells. You will see those kind of diagrams across the, my talk because I want to see to show you how the scope of mass uh, in my uh, lab just move forward on the, exactly the same type of cells because that shows what the progress of the of the cells are. One of my collaborators, when we talked to, to him originally, he is a true biologist, kind of listened to me for half an hour without asking any questions. And then I was kind of start worried about that what, what's the reaction? Is it does he like what we do? Doesn't he not like it? So what, what we're doing? And then the single question was, he said, if it's only for the single type, and then it's, it's no, no, no go because we can do it much easier with the RNA seq and much cheaper. That's what, what is much more important. And I totally agree with him that if this technique will come up only with the uh, separation of the cell types, that it's actually dead end. I don't want to proceed there. I want to show you and probably convince you during today that it's not only for the single cell type. Uh, we can do a little bit more than that. We took these two articles uh, uh, for the chemical treatment of the cells. The first article just treat Jurkat and U193 cells uh, with the PMA activation. And uh, we know that it's actually uh, do the protein kinase C complex and uh, actually activate several intracellular and signal pathways there. The second paper from Matthias Mann group, uh, they just do the Jurkat and K562 cells and they treat it with the decidinib drug. And the setting drug usually, as you can see here, this just uh, activate MAP kinase pathway and, act, uh, and affect it about 1,000 phosphopeptides. We decide just to replicate exactly these two trials on our, our cells and see what we can see on the scope MS type of approach. Here is the Jurkat cells been treated with the PMA. That's a separation of the single plate, 96 well plate. That's how much cells we got from the single plate. Now, as you can see, it's not actually a separation anymore from Jurkat versus U cell. That's both Jurkat cells. The red represents controls. The blue represents those that have been treated. Here you can see the uh, differentially, uh, heat map of the differentially expressed uh, proteins. And you can see it's a massive shift in the proteome upon the treatment, which is not surprising because basically we poisoned the cell. There is uh, not much surprises there. The only uh, exactly the point we would like to see how well can we separate them upon, upon the treatment. And, and you can see they will have been separated pretty well because there is no problem to separate them. It's actually a cheat because we, we introduce a lot of changes in the proteome. We'll, uh, we'll look at the same uh, uh, situation of uh, U937 cell. Again, we have a uh, treated and untreated cells. Here I would like to pay attention that there is a separation 
of about the same cell uh, as the 96 wall plate, but now we spread them between the four different plates to actually look into the possibility of the plate-to-plate -plate differentiation, how they will actually play with it, which is other. Uh, what's the noise level and what this uh, batch effect compared to the true biological effect can be visible on single cell. As you can see, they're separated pretty well. Of course, after the normalization, there is no magic here. The normal normalization has to be applied to see several plates at the same PCA plot. And uh, it's a little bit massive here, heat map, and again, a massive change in the proteome of differentially expressed proteins that we've been, uh, been able to detect. The second exercise that we try to do here, there's K562 cells treated with dacetiny, which we know actually affects mostly phosphoproteome, not the real proteome. And again, the separation here, uh, as you can see on the single PCA plot, we specifically put three different plates to look for the possibility of the plate-to-plate -plate variability and actually batch effect. As you can see, we can still separate them pretty well. Uh, amount of the proteins that are actually changing or we, what we think to be a differentially expressed quite low. Again, not surprising because we didn't do a long treatment with docetinib. We just did exactly the small, uh, very short treatment with docetinib to all, only activate things that are mostly phosphorylation uh, related, not really a change of the protein abundance. And that's exactly what we see here. Uh, the same here, the jerked cells. We're coming back to the, our favorite jerked cells. The separation of the treated and untreated jerked cells across the five different plates that has been denominated here by, you know, circles, triangles, squares, and so on. As you can see, there is no batch effect, which I have to say it's wrong a statement. There is a batch effect always. We have to normalize it to it, but it's not normalizable, and we ha can put data of, of different plates into the same study. Here, again, not many things that I can show you on the heat map that actually visually different between treated and untreated things. Although, uh, if we'll look at the analysis of differentially expressed proteins, there was quite a bit shows to be uh, as a differentially expressed upon the dacetinib treatment. Uh, those exercises that we did with the drug treatments just would, would like, as a first step, that we can actually look into the uh, differential uh, application of the proteome changes upon treatment on the same si uh, cell type, not the different cell types. Uh, the next experiment I would like to show here, that's our first foray into the uh, tissues. That's our collaboration with David Sinclair Lab and Harvard Medical School. And uh, brain mice with the very young and very old mice, uh, we have uh, five parts of the brain that we just e extract the uh, microglia from. And they were fact sorted into 96 well plate and then uh, undergo the MPOP procedure and 96 well pre preparation for the scope MS. Uh, that's basically the workflow, how to go. The six months old, 24 months old mice uh, go to the brain dissection with, uh, uh, Israel did it in, in the lab. He is present in, in, in this audience. Uh, and then he did a mild digestion with papain. Then these samples come to the Zach. Uh, Zach did the antibody labeling uh, procedure and did the fact sorting for us into 96 well, well play format. From here, just Nikita did the preparation of the Team T labeling and then transferred to the mass spectrometry. And we did the typical scope of mass uh, analysis of uh, the cells now, this time from tissues. There's an extra challenge in the tissues, extra challenge how to make a preparation and extra challenge how to actually make sure that what you're measuring there is a true biology and the cells are not really stressed, but that's all. Uh, can be discussed offline. Here we have a luxury in this, the same experiments. Again, five brains, the same things. We have a luxury of have a bulk proteomics data as well as the single proteomics data. And that's why our first foray was into the possibility to look at the exactly the same uh, material from the brain and do the bulk and the single cell. As you can see, those Venn diagrams shows that we have a quite a good correlation between all five parts of the brain, between the bulk differentially expressed proteins and the single cell differentially expressed proteins, what we think are differentially expressed between two, two type of mice. And as you can see in each uh, case scenario, we have something which is unique to the single cell experiment versus the bulk experiment that we have done for those five parts of the brain. Here I would like to show you the PCA, how they look like. Uh, to the left part, that's a hippocampus of, of the cells. There is, there is a red one is old, the green one, uh, blue one is young. And then here that's olfactory bulb, again, the separation between young and old part. 
We've been able to separate those. They're just quite uh, interesting uh, data to play with. It requires quite a lot of statistical approaches. And normalization, again, it's very important to know what you're dealing with because we do have a noise. That's a by default. There is no surprises. We shouldn't fool ourselves. Our data are noisy. Okay, uh, next. Uh, it's a temporal cortex this of separation you showed here and then uh, cerebellum. Uh, again, separation here, no surprises. We can actually separate young and old cell, uh, microglia cells by differentially expressed proteins, which we think statistically uh, differentially expressed uh, upon the aging. What is interesting, I think, in this study was this case scenario. That's triatom. Here we see the uh, very interesting uh, situation where we can see two distinct population which is separated perfectly here and here on the second PC because we always do separation on the second PC because we know our PC1 is a noise and there is no surprises there. That's why they do very well separate here as in two distinct population, but those are truly independent from the age. What it means that in striatum, at least here, we can see something that it actually drives them apart more than an age. Uh, of course, uh, looking for the uh, biomarkers that we found for the age and from different uh, four parts of the brain, we always can do this. We find those the biomarkers that are responsible for the age and can separate them as day and night. There is no problem with this. There is a still biomarkers of aging there, and there is no surprises there. But it is most important here that it's something more biologically relevant than age between these two cell population. I think this is the beauty of single cell proteomics because we will not be able to do anything like that from any other type of proteomics experiment. And I think that uh, illustrates very well why we want to do this and how we can apply this for the further analysis. Here I would like to show you the PCA. Again, we like PCA in our labs. That's our way to doing things. Uh, of the all five parts of the brain that have been actually separated here, using those the aging biomarkers that we, we, we believe are important for the microglia of the very young and very old mice uh, in one, one plot. And that's kind of the uh, summarize of this particular uh, collaboration that we have for the microglia cells. Okay, uh, that's what, the, uh, what we've been able to do with the MPOP technology and scope MS, and I would li like to just uh, go to the uh, problems that we have. The technical challenges for the single cell proteomics, I, I think there are three main ones. The isolation interference, the missing data, and of course the uh, proteom dynamic range. That's a general kind of situation. I think the last one is not only the applicable to the single cell proteomics, it's a general problem for any type of proteomics. The dynamic range is, is, is what we're facing. The first two actually are more or less Im uh, important for us because, uh, well, in isolation interference, we, we understand that we have it. and that's actually much more proficient than, than this picture. This is the, probably the best case scenario what I have with all my data. Usually it just grows like that. Uh, that's why we do have isolation interference and we, we know that and we just need to live with it or deal with it. And actually that's what one of the things that where the uh, vendors of the instrument should help us to actually get rid of it because it's possible. We know exactly how to uh, treat this uh, Co-isolation, we know how to separate them, and that's where the uh, vendors of the machine should should kind of put a put a force on it. Missing data. Here, I would like to represent probably the worst case scenario because that's a very informative. Uh, in average, as you can see, the first run and, and here. Each of these set represent a single mass spec run because you can see there's eight single cell chan channels of the uh, uh, TMT10 which is run through the mass spec. Here we have a 65% of the missing data and what I call the missing data meaning we did not identify the peptide or protein across the all cells in the particular uh, study that we do. That's what we call missing data. If we didn't see it in one single thing it will show up here. Okay, here we have a 65%, then it grows to 70%, uh, then it grows to completely fail run here for chromatography clock columns. I don't recall anymore what it is. And then those skyscrapers around here tells us that uh, our uh, 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 robot that we're using for speeding the TMT samples into it, just one of the chip that we use for the particular TMT channel was clogged and it was not delivering the TMT channel. That's why there is no surprises here. If there is no TMT, clearly no signal. 
That's why we do actually, this one of, one of those plots actually tells us that we are do actually measure a real data because if there is no TMT, then there is no signal. That's why to overcome this problem, you know, my lab was concentrated in, in uh, you know, in improving things, how we can improve things, you know, how we can bring the single cell proteomics to the area where the biologist could, could be interested, to the area where we can actually start looking into the real biology and actually improve things. Uh, technique naming games. Um, here we have interesting approach that um, community to try to push forward different things, produce different form of techniques and respectively uh, gets new methods. Here we have, and these authors prepared a new method, according to them, that has a boosting sample channel and um, single channels here that represents very rare amount of cell population, and they use the boosting samples to actually improve things. Um, I'm not sure that I can separate this type of ideology from this, even though 131 channel will exactly use the same things. That's why I think the new names um, might be an improvement, but I don't see how. And if, if, the, if the just new names was just uh, comes from the point that this was applied not to the single cell, but to the rather rare cell population, which is really great, which is absolutely uh, perfect, then I think it's, it, it's a little bit too late. In 2017, my lab published uh, this study where we did use actually TMT label and boosting approach to look for this very rare microglia cell times to actually get analysis of such cells. That's why this is done before. Um, if uh, the new name deserves analytical chemistry uh, page, then I think it should be something a little bit more into it than just a new name. That's why I don't think the change of the name in games actually will help community to get deep, deeper. I think it should be new original ideas or ideas which is conceptually new to get into the cell. Okay, let's go to the new ideas. Um, our new method is called scoped MS. This is still single cell proteomics, no changes there. ED would be for the extra deep. Extra deep, what we do here, we've been playing with the carrier channel on the position of the carrier channel. Uh, we've been using 131, and as you can see in our original paper, then we move to 126, then we start just playing with it. We run a lot of just carrier channels to see how the instruments play with it. And then we can out, came up with the idea that the, our biggest problem or biggest limitation of the scope of mass that we've been locked in the amount of the 200 cells in the carrier channel. Because as soon as you, you go further down after 200 cells, the problem is that your carrier channel is the really, really high peak in your HMS2 spectra. And you started hurting yourself by identification. By adding more, you actually get less IDs. And that was really limitation that we tried to overcome and get to the deeper end of the cell, how to get used to it. You know, it was a lot of kind of thinking through and possibilities and trials. We came up with the idea that we're not going to detect it at all. And as you can see here in these two pictures, this is identical peptide run on identical runs uh, of exactly the same amount of the carrier channel. And as you can see here, the base peak is, is the carrier channel itself. Uh, here we're not detecting carrier channel. And now these peaks are just start growing from the, uh, from the base and they just actually become uh, quite abundant peaks across the uh, spectra. And that's how we can get identification. That allows us to go instead of 200 cells in the carrier channel to more than 2,000 cells in the carrier channel if we want to do so. We're not necessarily need to do so, but that allows us to go to this. Again, to repeat, these two are absolutely identical spectra from about 200 cells of carrier channel. There is no changes there, it's just different type of detections. Okay, uh, new scope to mass, what, what the scope of mass allow us to do and what the type of uh, new inventions or new original ideas that we try to implement into the, into the technology. Here, uh, what, the, what the company called Game Change in Technology is basically chip-based columns, which I really think it's a great idea. It's basically a chip covered with the C18, and then with the chromatography picks goes through, you have a actually very good uh, separation of, of your peptides, and the peak shape stays pretty well. That's why we really like this kind of idea, this technology and we apply here in, in our lab. That's exactly how it looks like in our lab. Since you've seen the previous uh, 
uh, part of, of the instrument that we're using. We're currently using HFX with the double pump. Since uh, we, we have a double pump, we have the two 10 port valves. Here between these two port valves, you see these two small things are, that's a trapping column, again, microfluidics trapping column, and then these two attached to the uh, door of, of the pump, that's a, a analytical columns, 50 centimeter analytical columns. With this setup and uh, with the MPOP technique and with the scope MS, all these three together just came us, uh, to the game uh, all together, try to improve and get to the original idea to get deeper into the uh, single cell proteomics. Okay, um, when all those techniques was optimized and we started actually using them in, in, in the beginning of this year, in the February we comes back to the Jurka and U137 cells now being prepared with MPOP and the scoped MS technique. Here we have uh, about 2200 proteins based on 13,000 peptides and 165,000 PSM. When we just go through the uh, our learning curve of the column preparation technique, you see here, per each 96 wall plate, we start from the 78 cells successfully. We're going to 92 cells. We're going to about 2,600 proteins with 20,000 peptides. And the latest data we are about here, we actually really think that we nailed down the ability to get a preparation based on the 96 wall plate with the special treatment of that plate to the really almost no losses during the plate. We had the page right now on 2,800 proteins based on 22,000 peptides and 220,000 PSM based on the each plate. Um, we are doing PD, and this is the proteome discover outputs. You know, this, this number come from the proteome discover. It's a 1% FDR on, uh, on uh, both peptides and, and the protein level. Uh, here, that's the latest data. When we put the three plates uh, together, again, um, we have about 279 cells currently for the three plates. Uh, the three plates have been sorted pretty differently. We sorted four by four, two by two, and one by one. What this means, we, in the fact sorting machine, we put the first four, uh, four row in 96 well plate as a J, and then last four is a U, that would be four by four, or we just do two J, two U, two J, two U, that would be two by one, and respectively one by one will be J, U, J, U. So I want to be sure that we are not in the, dependent upon how we actually sort the cells, and we truly separate cells upon the proteum differences, not some, some kind of artifacts. And th those three cells put it together, that's actually how they look like. There are some you know, cross section here where the cells are closely related to, but we get used to such pictures and we want to try not to separate them too much, which we could, not to lose the real data, and that's currently what we think is the differentially expressed proteins between these two cells with the depths. We're going to about 3,600 proteins here with 31,000 peptides. Here, I think we're getting close to the RNA-seq uh, levels of the low type of coverage in the RNA-seq. We're not there yet. It's just the path towards the RNA-seq, but I think there is a hope there to get and catch up with the uh, RNA-seq guys in the future. Uh, what another uh, type of uh, improvement or, or lesson we learned for the last uh, year, uh, how we actually sort the cells. We learned uh, that sorting cells into the plate just sorting cells, make sure that it's a one plate, doesn't really play a, a really a significant role in analysis on biology because what we can do now, it's a three, three to 500 cells. It's not enough to actually sample that amount of cells. That's, that's a bad idea. We have to make sure that they're single cell. That's the first step. We have to make sure that we actually do uh, analysis of some particular cells and actually be very specific what exactly cell type we would like to actually look. Thank you to Zach, he's done a great job, absolutely beautiful job on, on making sure we separate particular cell types. And now I can show you that those are the same experiment that we've done before on the microglia, and we would just sort cells without any markers. We do repeat the same type of analysis, but now this time it would be brain activated microglia based on those known markers. Here we have uh, three plates. We successfully identified 252 cells that is quantifiable. Again, separation between age, old and young. We do believe that this is differentially expressed proteins that separates the young and old age. I cannot tell you everything that it's in this plot. Just want to pay attention to you to this tight cluster, which appears to be a highly uh, expressed in the, in the Parkinson, Huntington, and Alzheimer's disease, and that's what we think is we're very excited to look at that area and see what the particular type of cells 
in the brain would be responsible for the aging effect and what the proteomes are different in the aging effect on the activated microglia. Uh, next step, uh, to go deeper, how we can go deeper. I think in the previous uh, numbers that I showed to you were about the 3,800 proteins depth on the single cell. It's pretty good achievement and I think we cover possibly not close to, but we cover possibly as much as we can in the 96 90 uh, minutes window of LC time that we, we pick to be our standard LC time for what HFX instrument that we're using can do at the same time on, on the depth of the protein when we just spike uh, our carrier channel into the proteome. How we can do further than that, um, here we just, uh, I, I show you the Matthias Mann article from 2011 where they estimate uh, the full protein coverage they, and the average of the copious number per cell they estimate to be 18,000. Uh, later, our article here estimated we have about 50,000 per corpus per cell. Then a two part uh, uh, from each other, about twice. That's why let's kind of uh, make sure that we are not just uh, exactly measuring this or this number, but let's assume that it's 18,000, which is the average number. And then based on this number, and we put a, a 20 transcription factor synthetic peptides into our mixture and just run it and see what we can actually detect and not detect in those. As you can see, there is a different numbers of copies per cell of those transcription factors that we've been able to identify based on this number. If it will be based on this number, we should just multiply uh, on two of of this number, and they pretty much cover here on this plot, all those blue bars, they cover all the possibilities in terms of the numbers per cell. That's doable. The only open question still, what do we measure at these, especially these copper per cell? Because we do know our data is noisy. We do have a correlation at any single ion that we're measuring. That's why there is a very important uh, message to the community and for us to understand where we come to the point that the natural copies per cell will actually will be out of perform of the coisolation effect of the ions that are comes from the proteins that are much more abundant from this area. So I'm not worried about this area and I'm not worried about those almost 4,000 proteins that we look through because we have a gigantic amount of data. And since I don't like personally computers and we have a gigantic amount of data, we need the people who help us with the analysis of such data. That's why Max Planck will be very helpful to actually help us to do more careful analysis. The Nikolai uh, create this DART ID things that we can actually gather better data together to improve the amount of the missing data across the runs. That's a very important piece too. And then starting looking here, yes, we can see everything in the proteome to the very crazy low levels. But we need to be realistic where those are small copies number per cell start to be playing a crucial role where the coisolation just kills a natural signal and we start to see a noise. Whew, here the phosphoproteome. Uh, we've been doing phosphoproteome for a while. That's why the new names will not help. It still can be done with the scope. And it's been done for the scope. What we learn across the, our you know, travel through the phosphoproteome analysis is that we have to be extra careful. Extra careful almost each step of the, of the preparation, data analysis, and analyzing things. Here we have uh, something that's a heat map plot, which we call red square plot for the obvious reasons. It's a binary pl plot. Here the red means we detect peptides, white means we didn't detect peptide. Here that's a detected peptide, 2200 uh, phosphorylation peptide, which is, comes from about 1200 proteins being detected. And um, we always, you know, community, we are always kind of worried about what actually we detect. And is it noise, is it the real things? And this one of those red, red plots are usually uh, gives me a relief of, of uh, what we're measuring. We are measuring true signal and that's great. Why I'm saying so? Because we did, you know, learn hard from this experiment. We just put cells into the four degrees LC compartment and let it run. As you can see the first run, we got almost everything and you can see that slow delay with time. That's a phosphopeptide dies in four degree. So we have to be extra careful. And it's of course not good, but for me it's a beautiful plot showing that we actually did detect 
signal from the phosphopeptide because they're naturally dying. The next problem, since we don't have the data here, we cannot use this for anything which we would like to make a conclusions of. As you can see here, there's a percentage of the missing data with this plot. What we usually do, we just take the data from here, and that's a zoom up of this data. And then we allow ourselves to put imputation, very sophisticated imputation, only to the 15% of the data, not more than that. On the non-phosphorylation side, we are not allowed ourselves to impute more than 10% of the data because with imputation of more, we've been able to introduce um, any T-SNE plot you want. Basically, being able to get any uh, separation, any type of things, depending upon what kind of imputation we use. That's why we have to be extremely careful what and how we can impute, and we would like to be on the safe side to impute as less as possible to really see the biology of uh, a biological system rather than something which is the statistic would place us. Because the methods uh, as a TSNI are very, very sensitive to the pattern. As soon as they see the pattern, they will make a separation of the cell types, which is, has nothing to do with the real biology. Uh, here, just to, to conclude that again, there is no magic here. We, we do measure in the real signals. That's our famous 4 by 4 type of separation. These are J cells, that's a U cells. They've been separated, that's a, a 96 well plate. They've been separated based only on the phosphorylated peptide. There is no any other peptides being taken into account for this type of separation. Here, our two by two case scenario, again, poor G and U cells that we continuously use in our lab, and actually separation between G and U, again, only on the phosphorylation peptides that have been used for this analysis. Single cell proteomics challenges. We have a couple of them. Um, well, let's quickly discuss uh, how many time. Okay, uh, what are they? First of all, price per analysis. Of course, here we have uh, a difficult because we need either cheaper MS instrument or probably the instruments which are equal in price, but they can do more cells per hour of operation. Either would help, and that's again to the vendors to, I don't think they will go for the cheaper port, but at least if they go for the faster, that will work too. Here, that direction clearly uh, goes to the uh, catching up with the single cell RNA-seq world. That's exactly where we need to be to be interested for the biologists. We need to be on the single cell RNA-seq depth, which is, I know, sounds crazy because one year ago, we've been actually below 1,000 proteins, but that's the only direction we can actually take. Otherwise, biologists will not be interested in what we do. Here, the amount of cell, amount of cell analyzed. Uh, truly double C would be helpful because even though I have a, a tandem pump in my lab, it still improves our rate by 1.6, not really by double, which is supposed to be the whole idea of double pump. That's why hopefully new truly double system would come to the place soon. And that would help us to, to get more cells per day or per one hour of analysis. And as you know, last uh, week in uh, ISMS was finally introduced the TMT16 plex, which is again, we can actually double now the amount of cells we do per hour by using 16 plex if of course term of Finnegan will, will, will allow us to play with it. New frontiers on the single cell analysis. Here I will, I will show you something which is in blue that I put for myself as a target in the last year conference as the last slide, and then just see how much we've been able to accomplish in my lab and what is these current still challenges are. Uh, uh, for myself, I put a target, just bring the coverage depths of more than 1,000 proteins, which is currently the new scope technique, uh, just go above 3,000 proteins. I think we're pretty well doing on this side. Improve the peptide coverage from the cells per study. The new technique and, and new ways we're doing it with the new columns, new chromatography, reproducible chromatography, brings this number from 25% to 60% in best case scenario. I think the careful uh, identification of what actually been collected is very important. And, and as I said, I'm just putting quite a bit of leverage on the current uh, software packages that work with the data because in those data that I showed you from GNU from the three plates, which is the latest data and where we are in the scoped MS, we have one and a half million MSMS events. It must be a lot of data there. We just don't recover enough. And that's, that's why I, I can see uh, search engines will help us. Analysis of 100 cells per week. Here we have a problem. Currently we have a 700 cells per week per mass pack of instrument. That's where we are now. And as I said, unfortunately, to improve this number, it's not upon us, it's upon the vendors to create a truly double LC. And of course, the TMT16 uh, plaques could help 
us to achieve that goal. And the last thing, which I didn't even thought that we can actually go to the routine analysis, but it's now in more or less routine analysis because we did learn how to actually do phospho uh, sample preparation. Currently, we are at about 250 proteins. For those that I, I, I show you, we see across the study. And those actually total identified about 1,200 phosphorylated proteins, which is more important, cover all major pathway in the cells. That's why if we will be able to actually make all those 1,200 proteins, meaning 2,200 peptides, into this area that we see them across, be more careful to make sure, make sure you detect them across the old cells and use them as a quantitation, we'll be in pretty good shape. And that's where I think very important area where we have to go for the next uh, next step in the single cell proteomics. I would like to thank you, the my collaborators in Harvard. They all in Harvard appears to be. And first of all, uh, my group, York, for his enormous analysis uh, and new methods and uh, reduction uh, algorithm, noise reduction, normalization, a lot of, you know, a lot of area was done by York here. Rest of my group for the enormous amount of the sample prep. John for his uh, ability to bring us a, a clean, reproducible, and simple electrospray uh, setup. That's why he's doing electrospray uh, ESI solution type of uh, collaboration. And then I have to reveal the scope MS was, uh, is under provisional pattern by Harvard University. Uh, as co-organizer of the company, I would like to thank you all for the participation. And uh, it's, it's been a fun day for me. It's a hard day, but it was a very fun day. I've, I've seen a lot of really original and very conceptual things which we can actually, as a community, could improve further down and actually answer some biological question and not only the cell type. And, and thank you for your attention. Uh, great talk. So for the phosphoproteomics, did you use the same sample prep method, but just search in addition for uh, phosphopeptides? Well, as a Kira channel, we've been, uh, we've been used uh, uh, specifically uh, enriched material to spike in the, into the sample preparation as a, just a phosphopeptide. That's why for the Kira channel, we did a uh, titanium dioxide enrichment. Okay. What are the proteins uniquely identified in single cells but not bulk tissue? What are you, uh, sorry. So you, you showed in your microglia analysis, yes. when you were comparing in the different regions, brain regions, you showed concordance between proteins identified between bulk tissue and single cells, but then there were some proteins exclusively identified only in single cells. Yeah, these Venn diagrams. Yeah, yeah. 20, 22, yeah. 15. Yeah, what well, are those? Um, I cannot talk too much because the collaborators are here and they, they still didn't publish here uh, these things. That's why, yes, those are very interesting things because um, they, it doesn't mean that they have not been identified in the bulk area. Uh, they've been identified in the bulk samples, but they're not a, 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 according to our analysis because we did apply exactly the same type of, you know, structures to identify differentially expressed proteins and there appears to be not to be differentially expressed on ah, the bulk. These are differentially sample. expressed, okay. Yeah, but they're of course in, in the bulk data because this is much, much deeper, you know, that seven, seven, I eight thousand proteins. All right, I think we are all hungry.